Okay, so welcome everyone. It's time. So we're going to start today's webinar style uh, lecture. And um, yeah, Yuichi will give uh, some presentation of his talks and I have the summary of my talk during the week too. Thank you, Yuichi, for preparing for us. Sure. Okay, welcome to our uh, lecture today. Uh, I'm going to start with last week's uh, Karma Lab, the topic of Karma Lab. So, <clears throat> yeah, uh, Buddha taught, Buddha spent almost uh, 45 years to just teach the law of karma, the law of cause and effect, because this is the foundation of the whole teachings of Buddhism. There are a lot of levels of understanding about this law. Even those people who haven't learned anything about Buddhism understand this law to some extent. Good, uh, seeds not planted will never grow. Seeds planted will never fail to grow. This is something that anybody can understand and accept, but <clears throat> They are deeper part of the law. And to understand the law of cause and effect to the deeper level is the purpose of this karma lab. Buddha's method is always guiding people from uh, easier part of the teaching to the deeper part of the teaching. In Buddhist term, this is called from truth comes various expedient means. From truth comes various expedient means. Or moving on the path from expedient means, we arrive at truth. Truth means true happiness. Okay, let me share with you the basic part of the Law of cause and effect first. <clears throat> if you plant rose seeds, you get roses flowering. If you plant the orchid seeds, you get orchid. If you plant sunflower seeds, you get sunflowers. Yeah, this is the law of cause and effect. Uh, in the example of the law of nature, the seed and the flower share the same quality. <clears throat> and this principle applies to all phenomena in this world. Yeah, seeds not planted will never grow. Seeds planted will never fail to grow. And if you look at the flower, you can, you can understand what kind of seeds you have planted. So this is something that almost anybody can understand. And the deeper part of this law is what is called my karma, my harvest. Yeah, this is the very deep part of this law. Let me share just one sentence. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, Buddha thought, my karma, my harvest. This means if I plant the seeds, I will be the one who will harvest the crop. And uh, no one else will harvest the crop of the result of my seeds. <clears throat> to understand it fully takes time. So please uh, listen to Dharma again and again. <clears throat> and uh, mm, mm. so yeah, 
the Buddhism is the teaching of compassion and uh, practicing acts of compassion is our daily practice. But compassion alone is not enough. Compassion needs to be accompanied with wisdom. Wisdom is very, very important in Buddhism. <clears throat> so people, uh, who have, uh, people who have a lot of wisdom can practice a lot of good acts of compassion. And what is, com what is wisdom? <clears throat> What's the definition of wisdom? Mm, simply speaking, uh, wisdom is the faculty to foresee the future. So the more wisdom we have, the more future we can foresee. On the other hand, if, uh, we, if somebody doesn't have much wisdom, he cannot foresee the future. Usually parents have more wisdom than their children. That's why parents always tell their children, study hard, study, study. <laughs> if you don't study, you cannot get good uh, score in the exam. You cannot enter a good university. And then you cannot get an ideal job. But children don't have much wisdom. So they always play video game. They don't, they don't study so hard. They don't have much wisdom. So like a professional chess player, uh, you know, they can foresee almost 20 to 30 plays ahead. The poorest, oh, let me share you uh, with, with you my slide a little bit to understand it easily. In the worlds of chess, the best players can see as many as 20 or 30 plays ahead. The poorest cannot see beyond their noses because they lack the necessary wisdom. Poor chess players move their piece and upon seeing their opponents move, they say, wait, <laughs> and retract a move. That's a poor chess player. How about this example? Uh, when you are when you are going to a restaurant and arrive at the restaurant parking lot, and uh, this is the parking lot, and you you can see a vacancy here, but other parts are, are occupied. And uh, if you are in a hurry and a little bit mindless, you just park in the part A, <laughs> parking lot A. And later, after finishing dinner, come into the parking lot, you find out that your, your car is trapped. Hmm. It happens so often, right? At that moment, because we are in a hurry, uh, we don't, we cannot foresee the future. Mm. It's very simple, but uh, when we are in a hurry, we are, we are, when our minds are preoccupied with a lot of other stuff, uh, we just follow the instinct of that moment, and then we regret later. <clears throat> now, uh, Vida and I are borrowing a cat. Maybe it's almost our cat now. <laughs> the real owner have a little bit allergy for cat. So maybe we are becoming the owner of the cat. So I have a lot of uh, chances to observe the, uh, the cat's behavior. And cats really like nibbling cables. Any, uh, when, whenever the cat find the cable, they try to nibble and uh, jerk it. <laughs> so we have to be very careful 
when recharging a smartphone or a laptop, uh, it might damage, cat might damage our laptop because it jerks the cable. But uh, when the cat nibbling then jerks the cable, uh, I cannot blame the cat. It's not fair for the cat. It's not cat's responsibility, even if it damaged my smartphone or laptop. Uh, nibbling the cable is the nature of cats. So wise person will not uh, place the smartphone or laptop in such a dangerous place where cats have accessibility. Or, yeah, unfortunately, uh, sometimes in summer we have ants invasion. And uh, the other day, for some reason, those ants like the cat's dry food. The other day I found a lot of ants gathering and uh, swarming around the plate of cat's dry food. I And I got into panic and I, I all tried to try hard to capture as many ants as possible with uh, tape. <laughs> but if uh, Beta has different method. She tried to find the entrance of the ants and tried to, to, to cover and uh, fill the gap so that no more ants will come and enter our room. So this is wisdom uh, or analytical meditation all the phenomena, all the effects has its own cause, has its own root cause. So Buddhist attitude is always to find the cause, the real cause, the root cause. And then if, it's, if we have bad effect, we try to eliminate the, the root cause or the bad effect. It sounds simple, but in reality, it's not so easy. It requires a lot of practice. I think I have one slide for this, just a moment. Um, oh, no. <laughs> okay. So there was a question about uh, Buddhist method uh, about the truth, uh, guiding people from expediency to truth. Uh, this is always the Buddha's method because truth is very difficult to understand. What is called truth is very difficult to understand. Truth is something that doesn't change that regardless of time and places. That is what is called truth. And true happiness is part of the truth or dharma Buddha shared. Because it's difficult to understand, Buddha's method was always guiding people from a easier level of teaching and to the deeper part. Like we start from learning arithmetics at elementary school, and little by little, we learned uh, mathematics and uh, advanced mathematics like algebra or calculus. Uh, we cannot just enter into higher advanced level of mathematics. We have to start from uh, arithmetics. So provisional in Sanskrit word is called upaya. It's also uh, in plain language, ex uh, expedient means. This, this means something that's necessary for us to understand the truth. If I use an example, uh, 
uh, let's say, a fine view from a third floor of a three-storied house is compared to the truth, the scaffolding, the foundation, and the staircase to the third floor is the provisional. To reach the third, uh, third floor, we need the staircase. To build such a house, carpenters need scaffolding. But after the building is complete, uh, scaffolding is not necessary anymore. That is upaya. Some uh, people feel a little bit scared to learn uh, karma be, um, for some reason, but uh, the law of karma is not scary. It's very logic, almost scientific. And uh, the more we learn, the more self-improvement we can make. Yeah, so it's always yeah, step by step, then uh, we can uh, understand it uh, steadily, even if it's slowly. And yeah, it takes time to, to understand the deeper level of my karma, my harvest. Mm. But the more we can understand my karma, my harvest, we can take more responsibility of our life. Mm. Instead of relying on other people to make us happy, we can make effort by ourselves to bring happiness to ourselves. Even though we are confronted with a certain misfortune, uh, Buddhist attitude is not blame other people, like I explained with the example of cat. <laughs> Yeah, blaming other people is like barking off on the wrong tree. So we need to find the cause and then uh, eliminate it. So the more we understand my karma, my harvest, uh, we can uh, have more freedom because we take responsibility. <clears throat> like in a car accident, no accident is 100% versus 0%. Each one of us contribute to the accident when we encounter such a collision or uh, any kind of accident. Time is running out for me. <laughs> I want to explain more, uh, but uh, mm, yeah, I have to do it next time. So Vida is going to talk about the purpose driven lab. Okay, very good. Thank you, Yuichi, for sharing with us about the foundation of Buddhism, which is the law of cause and effect. Uh, also known as the law of karma, which we have to have like a very profound understanding of in order to have the patience and the perseverance to go forward on our spiritual journey. And uh, where are we headed? <laughs> That's where the purpose and meaning comes into play, uh, which is actually mm, probably one of the um, most um, intriguing topics for me myself. When I found Buddhism 20 some years ago, um, I wanted to know what is the purpose of life? What that means is why are we even born? <laughs> why do we live? And why do we have to keep on living if life becomes very painful? Um, you know, if we ask these questions to a lot of people, they just kind of maybe change the subject or they might get a little bit uh, intimidated by these questions or they might just tell us, oh, are you depressed? <laughs> uh, but in reality, for any human being who is alive, um, Buddha teaches us since we were born, it's as if we've been tossed in the middle of a vast ocean, which is called life. If we find ourselves in the middle of a vast ocean, 
what are we going to do? So the thing is, um, uh, what are we going to do? So, you know, when I was younger, I couldn't watch the movies about uh, survival type of movies. I thought they were boring and kind of full of <laughs> tragedies or sad things happening one after another. But actually, now that I know Buddhism, I really appreciate those survival movies. And uh, my favorite one is Cast Away by Tom Hanks. Uh, because when he um, got stranded on an uninhabited island, <laughs> uh, he had to do everything all alone by himself without the support of anyone, just even making fire, <laughs> you know, the primitive way of rubbing stones against each other to the point that, you know, his hands were bleeding. So, um, yeah, so this is how he... Um, tried to survive and then he was little by little, like he started missing his family and he didn't know what's going on. And uh, yeah, so he was missing his family, didn't know what was going on. And he kind of began to lose his uh, will to live. And yeah, maybe some of you watched the movie, <laughs> you know, that famous scene, how he turned a uh, volleyball called Wilson, <laughs> he became his friend, just drew some happy face on Wilson on the volleyball and they started talking to the volleyball uh, just so that he could maintain his sanity. This shows how painful life can be if we don't know why we are here, why, what should we do? And uh, so Buddha compares our life to kind of a similar situation. We are stranded in an ocean and I always ask people, like, what do you think is the most important element if you find yourself in such a, you know, survival situation? What are you going to do? Uh, if you're in an ocean, the most important thing is to find out uh, where the shore is, right? <laughs> where the land is. And if we cannot find it, then we just look around ourselves. We find anything that's floating. Uh, for the time being, we try to grab hold of it and we kind of find some relief if we find a log or plank or anything to uh, rely on for support. Uh, but, you know, if a strong wind blows or a wave comes and then we can no longer rely on that log or plank, then um, we feel like we have to choke on salt water and then we suffer. If we look back at our lives, every time we suffered, probably it was because something we relied on, like one of these logs or planks, it kind of turned over and drifted away from us and we could no longer depend on them. And that's when we suffer in life. Yeah. And so regarding this, there is a passage that I would like to read here. Um, we have this book actually, it's called You Were Born for a Reason. It's a heavy book about purpose of life. And uh, yeah, there is part two, chapter eight. So which helps us understand the answer. So I will give you the answer and then we can go over it little by little. So there is a great ship surrounded only by sky and water. Each of us is swimming for dear life in the sea, searching for a nearby log stick or board to cling to for support. All around are vast numbers of people similarly tormented by wind and waves, betrayed by the logs and sticks they have found, choking on salt water, drowning or drowned. Offering earnest pointers to all who are floundering is an assortment of swimming coaches, endeavors such as politics, economics, science, medicine, the arts, literature, and the law. When will people be amazed at the absurdity that no one is asking the most important question, what should we swim toward? That is why must we live? The silence on this topic is life's greatest mystery and surely humanity's greatest tragedy. The painful sea of birth and death knows no bounds. We have long been submerged, 
own leadership of great compassion will take us aboard and carry us across without fail. To paraphrase, we have long been floundering, lost in the vastness of the ocean of suffering. The only thing that can take us aboard unconditionally and carry us to the far shore without fail is the vow of great compassion. The vow ship sails across wave after towering wave. However high the waves, the ship is higher still. Shinran, um, who is the founder of Pure Land Buddhism in Japan, pointed out the real existence of this great ship that can rescue us and the direction in which it lies. From the book, you were born for a reason. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so, so this is uh, the direct answer to the question why we live. If, um, there are, if there is no ship in this vast ocean of life, if we only have to find these floating logs and planks, then naturally um, we will not figure out what it's all about because one after another, we get betrayed by these logs and planks. One, every time we lose them, we are back at square one. Why did I spend all my time and energy pursuing something that later I found out it didn't have the power or strength to, to hold me above the water? What was it all about? It feels like a dream. Uh, in our dream, maybe we won a lottery ticket, we got this, we got that, but once we get up, uh, we wake up, we're like, oh, it was all gone. It was just a dream. So this is why uh, life becomes very painful. Buddha teaches us uh, the first noble truth. Life becomes suffering, but of course we don't live to suffer. That's not why we are born. That's not why we live. Uh, we live in order to find the solution to our life sufferings. That's why every day we can uh, uh, find meaning in our everyday life to understand the reason why we struggle and how we can uh, become free of suffering. Now, uh, if we don't have the human-like mind, uh, if you're driven only by our desires or greed, it's gonna be very difficult to get to this topic. Like Yuichi explained to us, uh, how we define the human-like mind is, to what extent do we understand that the seeds I'm planting every day through my mind, through my speech and my actions of the body, these seeds I plant, they all bring me back uh, the harvest, the fruits. So the more we understand the relationship between the cause and effect, naturally, the more effort we put in, in order to improve our lives, as you which explained through the law of karma. And in order to explain that uh, human-like mind, how we practice every day and how we can nurture this human-like mind uh, upon which this answer to why we live this great ship in the ocean of life becomes more and more clear to us what it is. So that is, this is a very good book I recommend to anyone who might be new or not so new to Buddhism. It's called Something You Forgot Along the Way, Stories of Wisdom and Learning by Kentetsu Takamori. And today's story is number nine on page 25. And this story is teaching us what it means to nurture uh, the compassionate mind, which is the human-like mind. Okay, let me read it for you. The poor window frame, an inspiring glimpse of a mother and child. This happened once when I was riding a train on my way to give a speech. The car interior was spacious and quiet with many unfilled seats. Feeling relaxed, I settled back and opened up a book I brought along. After a while, tired from reading and lulled by the rhythmical vibrations of the train, I began to nod off, only for my dreams to be shattered by an ear splitting whistle and the metallic screech of brakes. Apparently, the driver had found an obstruction of some kind at a crossing. The shock of the sudden stop threw me forward, but I managed somehow to stay upright. 
In the same instant, the shrill sobs of a little child rang out. I saw then that the seats across the aisle in front of me were occupied by a young mother and her child who had apparently been am amusing himself by sitting with his forehead pressed against the window pane, watching the scenery fly by. When the train jerked to a stop, the Todd's head banged sharply into the window frame. His wails grew louder and more frantic. Afraid he was hurt, I jumped up, but to my relief, there was no sign of injury. Then I witnessed a scene so heartwarming that I was deeply touched. As the child's pain lessened, he gradually quieted down while his mother rubbed his head reassuringly and murmured soothing words. Sweetheart, that must really hurt. I'm so sorry. I'll rub it for you and make the pain go away. But you know, you weren't the only one who got hurt. The poor window frame did too. Let's rub it and make it feel better, shall we? The tot nodded and sure enough, he and his mother together began to pat the window frame. I felt ch chastened for I had assumed she would say something more on these lines. That must really hurt. I'm so sorry. It's all the fault of this naughty window frame. Let's spank it and teach it a lesson, shall we? Such a scene is common enough, giving a toddler a vent for his rage and allowing the moment to pass. All too often when life deals out pain, people respond by searching for someone else to blame. Perhaps I reflected, we parents implant this response in our children without meaning to. The child is father of the man goes the same and surely parents have enormous influence in shaping the character of small children. People who think only of themselves and cannot empathize with others end up in the darkness. Those who would enter the shining pure land must take the high road of benefiting others as well as themselves for benefiting others is indeed inseparable from benefiting oneself. I left the train wishing true happiness to that mother and child with all my heart. Okay, thank you, Ruchi. Uh, yeah, so it's a very heartwarming story um, that we realize uh, when we suffer in life, instinctively, we like to find someone or something to blame. This mindset um, that someone other than me is responsible for my life or for my suffering. Uh, we sometimes call it like the uh, anti-Buddhist mindset. <laughs> this mindset actually prevents us from seeing the shore or that great ship. The great ship is not far away from us, but when the mind is so busy, uh, either driven by greed or endless desires in a way that all we care about is just one more log, one more plank. Maybe sometimes we push other people away. Oh, get off of this plank. This is my plank. It's my log. What are you doing here? You know, with that mindset, because we are so driven to find these uh, floating uh, pieces of wood, the driftwood, naturally the mind doesn't have uh, the clarity, the stillness to see the great ship right in front of our eyes or to even look for the shore that we can truly feel liberated from this suffering. Because while we're in the ocean, you know, some people get motion sickness, uh, there is no food or water, even the water is, uh, you cannot drink it. Uh, yeah, recently YouTube was watching Ocean Water, the movie I strongly recommend it. Uh, exactly what life is like, is like being stranded in this ocean. So the topic of purpose of life. So before we can understand the purpose of life. So purpose of life is like the truth. And based on what Yuichi explained earlier, we need to have the expedient means or what Buddha calls upaya, U-P-A-Y-A -A, uh, in Sanskrit is it's, uh, it's the expedient means or the provisional like 
the kind of uh, staircase or first floor, second floor, floor that leads us to the third floor of a house where it has beautiful view. Once we get to the third floor, going through that route, first floor, second floor, the staircase, then at, on that third floor, we can enjoy that scenic view, the beautiful view, and we can feel, I'm so glad I went through this uh, path. I am so happy that I made it to this point. So only when we feel, <laughs> we see something that beautiful, we feel rewarded for all the hard work we put in. Maybe sometimes we went through a lot of traumatic experiences. We felt like, is this really worthwhile? Do I really want to keep on going through this? If we don't know its purpose, that's unfortunately when people, think maybe life is not worthwhile and they decide to check out, which is very sad. But Buddha is telling us that don't give up hope. Uh, don't fall into despair. So first, let us cultivate the compassionate mind, which is uh, the human-like mind, by believing in the law of cause and effect deeply. The more we plant seeds of uh, kindness and happiness, the more happiness will be ours. Like Yuchi explained at the beginning, if we plant seeds of roses, we're going to get a lot of roses in our garden. If we plant seeds of onions, we're going to get a lot of onions. So by believing in this law of cause and effect, uh, we're going to be able to cultivate this human-like mind. Then for the first time, the question of I'm, I feel blessed in life. I have so many things, but why am I here? You know, sometimes people go through a sense of a, a crisis, like um, midlife crisis or just even an identity crisis. Who am I? So all of these things come back to this question of why we live and everything that's supporting us, like politics, economics, science, medicine, they are a uh, means of living how we go through this journey of life, the process that we are in, they're all supporting us in order for us to find the answer to why we live. So today I ran out of time for my presentation, but in the upcoming session, so uh, we will gladly talk more about the difference between how we live and then why we live. Means of living, what Buddha calls as upaya or provisional, the expedient means versus the goal or the destination, that happiness that holds us fast, never to abandon us, that makes us feel, this is why I was born. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so glad to be alive. Okay, so I think I need to give the microphone back to you. Thank you, Bida. So lastly, I'm gonna share with you the discussion we had in our happiness lab. And yeah, actually happiness is the ultimate goal of our Buddhist path, our spiritual journey. Some people might think uh, pursuing happiness, isn't it selfish? <laughs> people are suffering all over the world. Is it okay for us just to seek happiness for ourselves? Actually, we don't need to worry about it because the happiness Buddha taught is something we, we would want to share with as many people as possible. Once we achieve such happiness that will be lasting, that will never collapse, we will have a burning desire to share it with others. That's one of the features of this true happiness that Buddha taught. And when people enter priesthood or when people start, um, when people join a monastery, uh, they make vows. It is famous. It's called Four uh, Bodhisattvas Vows. Yeah, it's not only one school or limited schools of Buddhism, but it's common with most of the Buddhist school. It's very interesting, so let me share it with you. Uh, sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. 
delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to transform them. The Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to master them. Buddhist ways unsurpassable, I vow to accomplish it. Sentient beings means all living beings, um, with the exception of uh, plants and vegetables. The plants are not uh, considered as sentient beings. They don't have such egos or strong awareness of oneself. They, they, they are alive, but there is a little uh, uh, fine line between sentient beings and plants. So human beings, animals, fish and birds, insects are all sentient beings. In Buddhism, all living beings are equal. So the number is so astronomical, but we vow to save them, save, guide them to true happiness. Yeah, that's our, our vow, we, our purpose, our goal. Delusions, work, blind passions, are inexhaustible, about to transform them. Mm -hmm. Dharma gates means uh, the teaching of Buddha. Uh, it's con uh, compared to gates. It's the entrance. So entrance to true happiness. Mm -hmm. There are many teachings. So Bodhisattva vow to master them even it takes a lot of time. And but, uh, Buddhist way is unsurpassable. I vow to accomplish it. it. It might be difficult, but we will make effort to, to accomplish it and to be graduated from the University of Buddhism, something like that. So it's not selfish. It's, uh, it's yeah, a lot of compassion compassion to all humanity. So this is, <laughs> so yeah, Vida explained the importance of having human-like mind, human mind for humanity, mm -hmm. instead of animalistic mindset or hungry ghost-like mind. <laughs> Buddha taught a lot about reincarnation, mm -hmm. Uh, living beings keep birth and death among uh, these many worlds. But these worlds of uh, suffering or animal world or hungry ghost, uh, the world of suffering, don't e only exist um, after we die. This, is part, this part is important. Those different kinds of worlds also exist in, in our life, in this world. Yeah, Buddha taught this. Based on the state of mind, we live in a different world. This is what Buddha taught. Based on the karma of the mind, we live in a different world. Because our state of mind is different from other people. That means we live in a different world. Let me share with you a short episode from a Zen monk of ancient Japan. His name is famous. His name is Hakuin. Oh, so this is a... And okay, this is the story. Okay, Bida, could you read? the story. Okay, sure. 57, the gates of paradise. A soldier named Nobushige came to Hakuin and asked, is there really a paradise and a hell? Who are you? inquired Hakuin. I am a samurai, the warrior replied. You a soldier? exclaimed Hakuin. What kind of ruler would have you as his guard? Your face looks like that of a beggar. Nobushige became so angry that he began to draw his sword, but Hakuin continued, so you have a sword? Your weapon is probably much too dull to cut off my head. As Nobushige drew his sword, Hakuin remarked, here open the gates of hell. 
At these words, the samurai, perceiving the master's discipline, sheathed his sword and bowed. Here open the gates of paradise, said Hakuin. Thank you very much. Um, in this very short story, the state of mind of samurai changed drastically from anger to repentance or humbleness. When samurai got angry, Hakuin did it on purpose and demonstrated uh, the, the start of hell and uh, opened the gate of hell and the open the gate of uh, paradise, which is uh, also known as nirvana. When we are consumed with uh, rage and anger, that's the beginning of hell. So when we are always angry or full of uh, grudge, you know, such negative emotion, uh, people live in the world of suffering. Uh, yeah, we can call it hell. Yeah, hell in Buddhism is a little different because we create the world and we live in that world. That's the hell, it's the world of suffering. And the paradise too. Uh, our mind creates such paradise, nirvana. Mm -hmm. It's not other people create and we live in the hell, no. We create and that we live in that world. So everything starts from our own mind. So I want you to keep this in mind and then I move on to the, to the main point of the happiness lab. So the main point is the seized opportunity when we want to practice good deed. Buddha taught six kinds of good deed and he recommend, uh, encouraged us to put them into practice in our day-to-day -day lives. Let me briefly share with you the six parameter. Giving, uh, yeah, keeping promise, patience, making effort, self-reflection, and self-cultivation. <clears throat> um, just Understanding the importance is not enough. Uh, we have to put it into practice. And through our own experience, we can learn, uh, we can acquire the knowledge for the first time. We will understand the effect. We will experience the effect. And then, of course, we have to repeat it. And then little by little, uh, our understanding will become deeper and deeper. Just understanding the theory is not enough. It's, uh, it's the same when we want to learn swimming. Just reading a book about swimming is not enough. <laughs> we have to enter the swimming pool and move our body. Uh, like, uh, learning the, how to ride a bicycle too, or playing the guitar too. Uh, just uh, learning the theory is not enough. Uh, just uh, let me read just one short quote from a book of uh, psychology. Okay, Bira, could you read uh, maybe two slides? Okay, sure. Importance of practice. As Johnson points out, the brain must go through a procedure before the body acts. Cognition, perception, comprehension, decision, implementation, and then movement. There is no way to overclock this, but you can practice until these steps individually are no longer complex and thus no longer take up valuable brain computation cycles. Johnson likens it to playing an instrument. If you've never played a C chord on a guitar, you have to think your way through it and awkwardly press down on the strings until you make a clumsy twang. 
With a few minutes of practice, you can strum without as much deliberation and create a more pleasant sound. McRaney, David, you are not so smart. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, you know, when we hear the act of giving uh, in a six parameter, we think it's simple, but not, no, it's not simple. It's very complicated. So by practicing and then you, and we fail. And sometimes we feel like uh, our, our kindness is taken for granted. And we feel like other people are just taking and manipulating us or we just uh, becoming a, a prey or a victim. That's not uh, the result of uh, real giving. When we practice real giving, we will be filled with spiritual joy. And then we get more motivated to practice. So we need to understand the, the act of giving by practicing. So at the end of today's talk, uh, I just want to mention an episode from uh, Buddha's time. It's an analogy of uh, milking a cow. What kind of a connection there is between the uh, act of giving and the milking? Let me share it with you. Okay, could you read again, Peter? Okay, no problem. Seize the opportunity. Once upon a time, a man decided to invite many guests and treat them to a meal. Well, then what should I treat my guests to? He wondered. Realizing that he had a dairy cow, he decided to treat the guests to some milk. However, just one cow is nowhere near enough to supply milk for many guests. Also, if he milked the cow in advance and stored the milk, it would go bad. Of course, during Buddha's time, they didn't have refrigerators. After pondering for a long time on what to do, an idea came to him. I know if I milk the cow now, the milk will go bad. But if I keep it inside the cow, it will be fine. Wow, I'm a genius. Settling on this dubious plan, he decided to refrain from milking the cow until the day when the guests were due to visit. Soon the day arrived and many guests came along. The man went to the cow shed and tried to squeeze out some milk, which he thought had been stored inside the cow. However, he found that he could not get even a drop of milk. It had all dried up. The guests started to complain that they were hungry and wanted their meals. So the man confessed the whole story to them. All the guests then went home angry and mocking him. Thank you. Yeah, there was a vegan participants when, I, when we had this meeting. <laughs> and she said, cows shouldn't be milked. Their milk should be preserved for their young calves. That's true, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. This is just an analogy. So the, there's a message. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he, this guy had a good intention to, to treat his guests, um, relative and friends. That's a good intention, but he didn't have wisdom. Yeah, he didn't foresee the future. Uh, he couldn't foresee what would happen when he refrains from milking. And also he thought uh, the milk will pile up in the body of the cow, but it didn't. So the message, important message here is, um, if we want to practice act of giving kindness, don't wait until the milk will pile up. We should practice uh, when we think it's, that it's a good time, good timing. Mm. And I'm not so familiar with milking, but 
I think the more we, the more one milk, the cow, the more milk the cow will produce. Mm. Uh, so this is not abusing the cow. <laughs> I think cow will be happy when human being milk the cow. Maybe this is a little bit digressing. The message is the more we practice act of kindness, uh, the more good effect we will have. And if we wait and procrastinate it to the far into the future, the time uh, we can practice kindness will never arrive. We thought uh, if it's uh, material stuff or money, we think, oh, maybe next month or next year, I have more money, so I can make a big charity uh, donation to the charity. Uh, people think in this way, but when they have more money, uh, they change their mind. Maybe they, are, they have more desire to increase their money. So they will lose the opportunity for good. So even though the amount is a little, it's okay, it's amount doesn't matter. Our intention matters more. So try, we should try to seize the opportunity and practice good deed. It's not only money, uh, yeah, smiling and uh, volunteer work or giving kind speech, uh, cheerful greeting and show friendly gaze. Just looking at other people with uh, very gentle gaze. This is already uh, act of giving. So yeah, this is this should be our daily practice on our spiritual journey until we reach the ultimate goal of true happiness. So I think I ran out of time for today. Okay, very good. Thank you, Yuichi, for sharing with us. I'm so happy to have everyone here. Also, thank you to our IT assistant, uh, JK. And we have this, our YouTube channel here. Please uh, check it out. Tonight's video also will be there and uh, shortly. And then we have a lot of other videos there. And uh, yeah, we appreciate your support. If anyone would like to support our cause, we appreciate your support. Take good care of yourselves and people around you and hope to see you next time as well. Okay, bye-bye.